Hello, I'm Michael Redmond, professional Nine Dong Go player. In this video, I'll show you my first game of 2024. So it's my first tournament game of this year. My opponent is Seki Tatsuya. He's a younger player, a three Don professional. Um, he actually promoted to four Don just a few days after this game. So um, I guess he's doing fairly well. Okay, this is a middle game, a late middle game position. And I've given you three choices. So if you like to do problems like this, uh, you can pause the video, maybe take a screenshot, and you can think about where you would play with white. So I'll come back to that later in the video. Okay, here we go. I have the white stones. It's the first round of the Meijing elimination rounds. So I still have a while to go before I get into a league or something. On the clock, we have three hours, and then there's overtime of a minute per move. After that, uh, the Komi is six and a half points. So black plays the Kakari here. Um, the two corners, the upper left corner and the upper right corner, are sort of Miai. So for instance, if black had played a Shimari, then I could have played a Shimari too. So this would have been another uh, opening. And when he plays a Kakari, I could have played a Kakari in return. So this is actually a fairly commonly played opening where black gets to press that white down there and white would jump and then black could play here. So in general, white has a fairly low position on the top side, but does have Sente to play this big point at seven. So it's supposed to be close enough to even. Um, I tend to like to play the large scale opening with black. So I, I've been in similar positions with black, but I tend to avoid this with white. So in this game, I actually played here. And this sort of maintains my strong position in the top right corner. Of course, if you're an AI, you'll probably want to jump into the through three point. But we, we weren't doing that in this game. So he's a, he played the Shimari. That's a big move. And again, white could have jumped into a through three point also. So an opening like this. But I played the pincer. So this is also a um, natural move, stopping black from playing a, an extension to the side. And black played this move. And also I played here. So we're both building on our respective sides. Actually, one of the main points of this video is going to be how to approach the left side, which is a relatively challenging thing for many players to do. Um, white actually has a number of options. So that's something I do want to talk about. For starters, I'm going to talk about this move, which is a move that I use a lot. And I like this move. I could have played it here. And generally you would expect black to protect the corner. So black will play here and white will play here. And this is the modern way to do it because white gets to uh, play this asking move, asking how white, how black is going to capture that stone. So usually if black plays here, this leaves some bad Aji when white curls around here. So there's the Aji of white extending it C18. So generally black wants to take from the other side. But if black immediately does that, white gets to cover here. And that would be a forcing move, giving white a good shape on the left side. So the way it's played out is black usually curls around here and then takes this way. So this gives black a, a good territory in the, in the corner, very good Aji, but white also gets to play the extension here. So this is an even result. It is one way that white can deal with the left side. And um, the reason it's so important to have a plan here is because of the fact that black has a local majority, a local advantage on the left side. It means that if white is careless in how white invades, then white's gonna get into trouble there. So this is one way white can handle it. It's a modern Joseki. In the game, black played a, pin, um, a shoulder hit here. It's not really good to play this move, which gives black the jump here, which is again threatening to play at m3. And so white would want to do this. This is uh, sort of similar to the way that the top professionals were losing to uh, the master version of AlphaGo. It was, I guess it was 2016. They were playing for territory a lot of, in many cases, and AlphaGo would dominate the center. So allowing black to dominate the center to this extent is a bad idea. AlphaGo is punishing them for that. And so that's something we learned from AIs. But it's relatively okay for white to play this move, which is the game move. And the difference is that black doesn't 
get so many stones. So like if black plays something like this, I'm not going to continue answering that. So black doesn't get such a, a strong um, influence towards the center as he was getting in this variation. Okay, back to the game. So I slided. And I was expecting him to play here, which turns out to be uh, the move that my AI was suggesting also. And something like this. So this way of playing would be a way for black to escape out to the center and would be making Mi of the top side and the right side. So if white plays this way, black will press white down on the right side. And so on the right side of the board, black is just focusing on reducing white's potential. And later on, black will be switching back to the left side of the board, which is where black is trying to um, gain a moyo, make a, a large area. On the other hand, if white um, extends on this side, white would have a, a better position on the right side, but black would be able to surround the top right corner. So uh, black would then be looking at moves like 017 later, which would start to squeeze the corner. So the, black has some potential to be playing forcing moves there. Okay, so in the game, um, he attached here, and this was probably a bit of an overplay, or you might say premature. So black could have lived in the corner, but playing something like this, this is actually a joseki that we've had for a long time, but um, it's a bit premature, and white gets a good position on the right side, so, like, if the game was further along in the middle game, maybe, sometimes this would be a very effective way for black to play. If we ignore the two stones on the outside, these two stones, then it's actually, um, you can find it in Joseki books. It's a standard way of playing. Um, but it's usually played later in the game. It's a bit too early to do it right now. And this is a satisfactory result for white. Okay, so he cut... And so the idea is he's trying to sacrifice the corner on a, large, a small scale. So like if I did something like this, he would probably just play something like this. And he could extend. Or if I were black, I would uh, play out here anyway. And so in this case, he's gotten some a bit of a position there in the lower right area, which is going to, for instance, if we get into this fight, it's going to link up with blacks pressing down here. So it's going to link up to that group in the top right. Or black would like it to do. So I played more forcefully here. It was actually best for black to play here. And if white covers here, black has a forcing move here. So this is actually threatening a ladder. Play on the other side, it's going to be a ladder. Towards the upper left. So if I play here, it's still bad because he can attach here and he's going to break into my territory to a certain degree. So like this. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a bit painful. So I would probably connect here and he would play here. So this is a variation that this would have been slightly better than the game for black, where black is getting a position on the right side and has the squeeze. So it's a fairly even result. So um, this would have been very elegant um, playing from the outside without playing any stones inside white's territory. It would be a more effective way of making the forcing moves from outside. So it would not be losing as much as the sequence played in the game. In the game, he started from the inside, which is going to die. And then he's going to try to squeeze from the outside. So he's losing some points um, in the beginning, which was why this was not the optimal way of playing. And then he pushes here. So it's the same kind of threat. Uh, but you might notice he hasn't played through at N3 yet either. So if I answer on this side, which is maybe what I should have done. If I answer on this side, he does have uh, this move here, which is threatening a ladder again. So it's a ladder. This would be bad. So if he played there, I would have to play this way. And actually, this this is another option. I, this might have been better than the game. In this way, I'm forced down to a connection on the first line. But Black also has the issue with a cut at N5. So this would be an acceptable variation for me. I do get the whole corner territory. In the game, I didn't like being forced to bow down like that, so uh, what I did was I played this move. And my feeling was that allowing black to capture this stone in a ladder 
in this part of the board, maybe it's not such a serious problem for me uh, because the, the, the capture there on the right side of the board is not going to really connect up to a black moyo, is what I thought. And in this case, I've um, kept my position on the bottom side. So there's uh, pros and cons. It's a pretty subtle difference, actually. But I do have to be careful at this point, because if I play away, black can play uh, this attachment to close off the bottom side. So what happens here, I have to take on this side, and black gets to close off the bottom side. And in this case, that strong position that black has towards the center, it means that I don't really have much potential with that white stone uh, that's five. So that gives black a good position on the lower side. Just going back a few moves, if I play on this side, this is going to be a disaster uh, because I lose the center. So I don't want to do that. So because of that, I protected here. And again, I have to be very careful here because of that Tesuji at N2. So for instance, I don't want to play here because it's actually it's not connected. Uh, black can play, in this case, black would start with the kick there, and then the same sequence would allow black to cut it off. So the fact that one is actually not a connected shape makes it probably a bad idea. Uh, black still has a strong position towards the center, so it's not going to be a happy fight for me. So I played here. So I still have to be aware of the fact that this point here, it's sort of forcing. So if black gets a stone there, let's put a black stone there. Um, black can then play this sequence again. So I have, um, I was actually aware of that. And black, let's see, black played the forcing moves on the right side, pressing me down to the third line, and then he played here. So this is the kind of move I generally don't really get. Um, but when he played it, he is making use of this forcing move. So since this stone is forcing towards the bottom side, I was aware of the fact that I probably don't want to jump out. So jumping out here where there is a forcing move for black at M4, it's usually not a good idea. I sort of had that conversation with myself. I was consciously aware of the fact, which makes it sort of funny that I seem to forget it later in the game, but uh, we'll get to that. Okay, so this is a point where it's about time for me to invade the left side. And I have various choices. So I've already shown you earlier in the game this attachment at D16. At this point, I was actually um, a bit concerned about the center. So I had the idea I wanted to keep maybe on the fourth line. Um, in general, we say that if you're invading, um, if you're going into an entering an opponent's side, you want to stay on the third line. So um, for instance, if you want to keep things simple, uh, the Wariuchi, um, splitting the side like this, it's still an option, although, um, AI is often so different moves. This is still um, a very simple way to play, which is close enough to perfect that um, I'd, I'd say if you are feeling uncomfortable about all of the variations I'm about to show you, uh, you can just do this variation. And if white, if black plays on that side, white can play here. Or if black plays on the other side, white can extend. So leaving room for a two-space extension, that's actually, it's called the gold proverb. It's a saying we have, um, which is basically how to invade the side. If you leave room for this two-space extension at three, then white does have a little base there, which should make at least one eye. And um, if white adds stones to it, white will not get into great trouble. So this is a way I could have played. But the move that um, I played in the game was this one. This is a move where white is giving up the idea of invading the top left corner in return for getting some extra influence on that side. So that's the move I chose because I was concerned about the center. And I'm going to stay on the fourth line after this. I'm going to stay high. But it was interesting to see that Katago was suggesting this move. Uh, this is actually more old style. So it's, um, it's a move that we would play 20, 30 years ago, and it would be considered normal. So the idea here is that black has various ways of answering in the corner, and white's going to choose the wariuchi, how to split the side, depending on how black answers. So just to show you that other variation once more, we'll start with this one. So this is the uh, original idea. 
and black will probably play something like this to continue building towards the center. So this would be a game, but this move is trying to improve on that. How does white improve on that? So let's have black kick here. In this case, white would move one line further to the top. Um, to, white still has room to play a two space extension. And if black answers on this side, then white's going to get some extra room. So that this variation gives white some extra room on the left side with the active stones being nine and five, giving white some extra space. So it's not just that two space extension, it's a little extra towards the lower left corner and white has a safe group there. It's pretty much alive. On the other hand, if black plays from this side, it might look like black has some extra area. But the funny thing is that that exchange of one for two is actually giving white more room towards the corner. So in the lower left corner, when white jumps in here, white actually has more space. So for instance, something like this. Um, so it, it makes the 3-3 three -three invasion uh, much more viable. It works a lot better for white. So that was um, interesting. Let's look at some other variations for black. Let's have black play this one next. Um, in this case, uh, there's an opening there in the corner. There's a little hole at B3, which white might be able to use later. So white's going to play in a fashion that is going to make use of that. So the stone at one, uh, if we compare it to the other variation where black kicked and white had some room in the corner, in this variation, white wants to take care of that stone at one. So white's going to play a bit closer. Uh, at this point, making it more difficult or less appealing for black to capture that stone at one. And white, black's going to play from the white side. In this case, white one is peeking into the corner. And white can actually, usually can make an eye there if white jumps in at b3. So, uh, sometimes white can actually make an eye there in the corner. And so this would be how white would use the stone at one if black had played at c4 at two in this diagram. So if we compare that with this one, which is shutting off the corner, white's options in the corner, um, jumping in at b3 is no longer an option. White does have a wedge at c4, which could create some action. So in this case, white's gonna play one line further away and maybe something like this. So this again, it would be a little bit better than the two space extension I was showing you at first. Um, I think it's, this one, yes, a little bit better than that. There we are, so compare with this. White does have about four lines times two lines of territory. So it's something more like, looking more like eight points and it's usually gonna be enough to give white a living shape. So that's how white's move at one is trying to improve, this move is trying to improve the Wariuchi by playing a forcing move against the corner and probing to see if white's gonna play this one, if black is gonna play this one or this one or this one. Uh, actually, Black has one more choice locally, is this one, which is going to try to dominate the center and the side. In this case, uh, I would be able to live in the corner. Generally, this is considered good for white. So it's supposed to be good for white. Um, although Black does have a big area here. And after this, every move is going to be extremely difficult to calculate what's going to happen in this area. Uh, my computer seems to think that white's going to have no trouble just trashing the whole moyo, but you know, it would be an adventure for both sides uh, if if humans were playing, if I were playing. Um, apparently, white just goes in here. At this point, what makes it so difficult is that black has many options. So like black can protect the corner territory at e17. Um, he can try to attack from the side with c14, or he can try something else to just surround the whole thing. It's very difficult to even um, read. Uh, one or two moves into the future of the game. So it's um, it's going to be very challenging for a human professional. So just about anyone, I suppose. So, well, that said, I, I would be feeling it was an even fight at this point. So I played here. So I'm playing on the fifth line here. I'm trying to keep my stones high because black does seem to be starting to build a center moil. So that's that's how I understood this position. So it's slightly different from the computer. Although this move, um, it was it was ranked in the top three moves. So it, it wasn't completely 
um, unreasonable. So backplay here, and I extended on the fourth line. Again, if I had played on the third line, this would have been feasible. If black plays from this side, it, it reverts to something very close to the Wariuchi I was showing at the start. Or if black plays on the other side, then I'm going to sort of connect up to that stone on the fifth line. In this case, I have a good move at C14 waiting to play next. And I already have a fairly resilient shape. So, for instance, if black played here, a computer would probably have me playing away uh, to the top side or something. Okay, so in the game I played high. I was a bit worried about the center. And I capped black. Um, if black had played high also, then uh, there would be a weakness underneath. So I'd probably just play this and extend towards the corner. So this is a way I could have made a happy life there on the left side. Um, when white does enter a side that's dominated by black, um, the priority should be able to, should be to make a, a safe shape. It's not the way we played it though, um, but this would have been a satisfactory result for white. So black plays low. So black is trying to take away my base hoping to attack. And I capped. So black cuts me. So we're starting a big fight here. Um, it's sort of hard to say which is the main group for white, because I have two weak groups here. Uh, but my choice was that that group on the top, the three stones here, let's mark them, was the main group. And that was because I felt that there was some Aji potential for me to, to trade to the lower left corner. And actually, it worked. So you're going to see it happening in the game. So it's going to make me make it easier for me to explain, actually. Uh, so I played here. So I'm putting pressure on the two black stones. Uh, they're safe enough. Um, so for instance, if I play an attachment here and I try to surround black, uh, my shape is going to fall apart first. So this is uh, looking a bit dangerous. If I had played this one, uh, so it would be the most, the strongest fight, uh, maybe a bit dangerous. I, it would probably invade, it would probably involve maybe sacrificing the group on the top. I'm not sure how this would um, turn out. In the game I played here, and I'm already starting to think of sacrificing the two stones. So black played here. So this was a very cautious move, and it left me some forcing moves from the center. So for instance, g10 would be a forcing move that I used later. So the move that I was more concerned about was black playing from the top, which actually captures these two stones. And um, this is the variation in which I had the idea that I could switch to the corner. And actually, it pretty well matched what the computer showed me. So I was proud of that. Um, I was going to mix in this move. This, If white gets this exchange from 4 to 7, this will pretty much er erase the weakness at F10, F11. So um, it improves my group there. And then I can play here and attach in the corner. So this sort of connects up to uh, the the Aji at e7. So for instance, if black does something like this, um, then it, it's starting to look a bit dangerous for black. So something like this might happen. And um, even just squeezing like this would probably be good enough. So uh, he doesn't want to give me the Aji. He might just connect here. In which case, I would get a big corner. So this would sort of revert to a 3-3 Joseki, maybe. If I played here, it would revert to the Joseki. All right, in this game, since the side territory is pretty important, I might just play this way. Okay, so that's how I intended to use the two stones, the Aji, to switch to trade to the lower left corner. That was my plan. I was pleased to see that it was pretty close. My plan was pretty close to what the computer was showing me after the game. So he played here. I still uh, seem to have some Aji in the corner. So it's a very similar idea, only the corner will be a bit more difficult for me. So I tried this immediately while there was still some Aji with the, the two stones. And when black covered here, I already have some real Aji in the corner. So I played here immediately. And it's important for me to try this out before I fix the shape in the center. For instance, because if black plays here, I'm preparing to 
I'm, I'm ready for a fight. So if I want to fight here locally, I need to do it before I've strengthened him in the center. So the, for instance, if I play here, I'm hoping to make a life with something like this. So this would be a living shape. But if black plays here, it's going to turn into a fight. And I think I'm okay here uh, for the time being. Um, in this position, I'm okay. But if I had already played uh, moves like this from the center, for instance, maybe I wouldn't be okay. Maybe I would just die there. So it's important for me to be playing these moves in the corner before I do that exchange in the center. And he answered here, so I played to this point. If I play at b2, there's going to be a ko in the corner. So I just left that, and I squeezed from the center, and I played this final big point. In this case, um, in the upper right corner, it's a fairly common shape. Black still has some Maji at, for instance, at R17. But the fact that I have a strong group on this side, this is already a connected shape, the fact that this group is strong, and the fact that there's really no action on the top side either. It's not a big, uh, dangerous situation. I felt that I could handle that R17. So there was some calculation involved there, but I felt it was going to be okay. And so Black made the choice of just sacrificing that black song. So he plays here. And when you see this move, if you see immediately what black is aiming at, then you're an experienced player. Because actually, there is a move in the corner that black is threatening to play next. So the computer actually wanted me to defend against that. But in the game, I played a pincer. I was offering a trade. So the move that black has in the corner um, if you want to guess it, you can uh, stop the video here. You can pause it. But uh, the move that he played is this one. So this is the answer. And if white covers from the outside, black will have enough room to live in the corner here. It's just white's position on the outside is not secure enough to, to hope to kill this black group. So black's going to get six, eight points in the corner and have a living shape. So I covered on this side. So black does get a piece of the corner. And he's alive. Um, I was okay with this because I got sent to, to close off the center here. And I had the feeling that I was ahead. At this point of the game, white does have a small lead. Because of that, maybe he shouldn't have played the ko. I mean, maybe he shouldn't have stopped me from playing the ko. It would have been a more complicated game if Black had played somewhere else and allowed me the option of playing this co in the corner. To a degree, Black B3 simplified the game. So I pushed through and cut here. Um, I could have left this for later. It's not actually forcing. So it's actually a slightly questionable move, but he answered it. So there was a, the, the loss I incurred was relatively subtle. Um, I got a little squeeze here. Uh, but he does win the race to capture by one move. And here we are at the position I showed you in the start, where black has, um, white has various ways to play, and it's a question of A, B, or C. Okay, so this is the move I played. I'm going to give you the answer now. This is the move I played. And if you chose this move, you're the same as a 9 down professional, I guess. But it wasn't the best move. Um, it was actually a very difficult position for me. This is the borderline between the middle game and the end game. If we play just a few more moves, it's going to um, become an end game, and to a certain degree, professional players can calculate that. But at this point, there's still a lot of open area, and it's very difficult to calculate what the best move is. Um, I did consider playing something in the center, and it turns out that this was the correct move. So if you chose this move, you chose better than I did. Uh, the other move, uh, playing here, this is uh, not, not so important. So playing here would allow black to take a big point in the center. Actually, let's have black play here. I probably want to surround the left side here. So it would be something like this. Uh, very similar to what happened to the game, but that stone at one is not really, um, it's not really doing much. So it's, it's not a, an effective move. So that move is sort of out of focus. It's not as important as the center. You can see Black's getting some points in the center now. I think it's a 
point where the fact that I felt that maybe I was a bit ahead and I was actually correct in that assessment, it did make it, me a bit too cautious. So it's an interesting case where I think my emotions about how I was doing may be a feeling of a bit of complacency. It did affect how I thought about the game. So um, I can see now that this looks like a better move. All right, I made one more mistake later in the game, which I'm going to talk about. Now this move here, now this is a move that's relatively easy for humans to calculate. It's something like 15 to 20 points, and it provides an entrance to the black territory. So for instance, if white had played elsewhere and black here in uh, something like this, uh, you can see there's going to be a black territory there um, in this lower left area, which is going to be, um, there's white's running out of areas to attack it. Uh, the problem with this is that Black's group on the right is not 100% alive. So I would be doing stuff like this and starting to think of attacking that Black group on the right. So that would add to my options in surrounding the center. Uh, so it's relatively easy to calculate that this move is 15 to 20 points, and it gives me the extra feeling of safety that I can move into that area on the left but it wasn't as big as playing in the center. So it was, uh, strictly speaking, it was a mistake. I did le lose a, a couple of points, maybe three points in this exchange. Originally, I had planned to play here. And in this case, this would be better than the game. In the game, I played a more cautious move. So this would have been slightly better than the game. And if Black had played here, I would cut. Um, I don't really know how this is going to turn out. It looks like maybe Black can escape but it's going to be a bit tricky and um, hard to calculate for me. So I um, I ended up avoiding this variation. So I played safe and I'm still ahead. So that part of my calculation was correct at this point. Um, but I think I was sort of um, being a bit too cautious, maybe a bit complacent about how, how I was doing. And it led to this move. So like I told you, Black has a forcing move here. I told you that Black has a forcing move here. It doesn't work simply. So if Black plays here now, I would just connect. In this case, I'm going to be okay. Uh, because of that stone at J3. So that's another way that J3 is potentially working here. Um, however, when Black wedges here, which is the game move, now he has the attachment at N2. So in the game he played here, this was probably the losing move. Um, and he played here. So this was, this exchange was not necessary. So he should have just played here without that exchange. And the difference is that if I play this way, okay, let's do it this one first. If I play this way, he's going to connect. And this is a very close game because he's managed to cut me off. But if I play here, this is a collapse for white because it's a double Atari or I lose the stones in the corner. So this would be a collapse. So I would have to play here, and I would probably play something to the left, maybe this one. And this would be a very close game. I think Katago was giving Black a half point win, or a fraction of a point. Um, so it's going to be a very difficult end game. So this was Black's biggest chance in this game, I'd say. But when he plays this exchange, that exchange helps me in the center. So to go back to this, varia uh, this variation, if I play here, so that would resemble the game variation, he plays here immediately without that connection at M4. And he's still threatening the double Atari thing. So if I play this way, yeah, so he would play, I would play here, he would play here, and we would get into this very, well, something like that. Maybe he's going to push through once. And it's going to be like that. And I will be able to live. So this is very similar to what happened in the game, only the fact that Black has not played the exchange of a black stone here for a white stone here is very important because black can play from the other side. So when white plays here, black can play from this side and close off the center. So this would be a win for black. Okay, so I would call uh, the connection at M4, maybe the losing move. And now white's okay. So it's a very similar variation there. And I actually, I could have played at P1. 
Um, but I'm already gaining points here because this stone, it's a very valuable stone that I got here that reduces the center. So I'm, I'm already pretty well calculating that I have a winning position. So I'm just giving the extra security of a forcing move at M1. Okay. So now it's uh, an end game. Uh, this was a fairly good way, I think, of invading the left side. And he crawls here. So what's black doing on the first line? This is actually um, something close to five or six points. And I have to be careful. So it's a bit of a tricky move. I think um, black probably should have been playing somewhere in the center here. Or maybe this point. So th this is also a big point. So those are the two points that black could have been playing. Um, but he chose to play here. I um, And if I cover here, and I think I'm okay at that point, then I would be getting into trouble because there's going to be a co in the corner. So this would create a co. So that's a test to remember. So if white's going to answer here, white would play here. And um, compared to the game, these points are white territory. Um, but it's more important me, for me to play in the center. So in the game, I played here. So that's a big move. Added security to the white group on the bottom side and also reducing blacks uh, area on the left. And this is the Tesuji still. Only because I have not played at R1, I'm going to win by one move. So it, it, it was a good Yosei sequence, endgame sequence for black. And I guess the rest of the game is fairly straightforward. This was a Tesuji. Um, if he captures the stone, I get a forcing move there, which would give me um, a safe position there. So I could play it four, I could play away actually. So he pulled back. And yes, so we're uh, playing a fairly straightforward end game now. So let's just take it forward. Later on in the game, we, we gave and take a point um, while we were playing. And basically it was just, the focus was on um, keeping my center area. There were some cutting points in the center. I was just keeping that too good. So I, I wasn't worrying about that one point. Yeah, this is where I sort of gave back a point to Black, allowing him to capture these two stones. Yeah, but this was a big move too. You, you probably should have played an Atari there. Again, it's just a, a potential point difference that I'm talking about. And so we finished the game. Okay. And I won by three and a half points. So let's put up a result. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Let's fit it in. Not Okay, so that was my game. Um, in the commentary, I spent most of my time, I believe, on the left side. How to invade the left side. So let's just take one more look at that position. So I chose this move. Um, if you want to keep it simple, splitting the side is still an option. Sometimes white can play an attachment at D16 if you've researched that Joseki. And the AI move was b5 um, which was surprisingly a kind of a an old school move um, it's a move that you could see in games several decades ago so um, interesting and it works well in this opening so um, those are the main points i was talking about you probably don't have to pay so much attention to what i said about the lower right corner because it's pretty unusual uh, position so thank you for watching the video and um, i'll be back with more contents like this. Thank you.